In this video, I explain applications of infrared spectroscopy. I also explain Raman spectroscopy. Uh, the main application of infrared spectroscopy is in identification of functional groups within a molecule. This is an example of a random molecule uh, that has 22 atoms. Uh, from what we have learned in earlier videos, uh, this molecule is not linear, so you will have 22 by 3, 66 minus 6, 60 normal nodes. So 60 different nodes to vibrate. Uh, when you start to think about what type of normal modes this molecule will have, you see that there's a lot of CH stretches. You will have symmetric and asymmetric stretches right here and then right there as well. But then you have a carbonyl right here. So there's going to be a CO stretch. And there's an NH stretch as well, which is a little different. And here you have an alcohol. Now, if you think about where uh, uh, those normal modes, uh, the frequencies of those vibrations would be, you can also think, always think about this expression. The vibrational frequency under the harmonic approximation is this, right? And notice that in all of these bonds, there's going to be something about this vibrational frequency that is going to be different. For example, if you compare a CH stretch right here with a C double bond O stretch, you can see how the force constant will be different. Okay, that's a double bond, much stiffer force constant than a single bond. And also the reduced mass will be different. What this means is that every single uh, type of uh, normal node will absorb at a different frequency. They will appear in different regions of the spectrum. Okay, so in infrared spectroscopy, we actually uh, divide the spectrum into two regions. If we plot here absorbance, or most commonly is transmittance in infrared, versus frequency, or more commonly wave number, uh, I'm actually gonna use wave number. It actually, wave number runs from uh, high to low this way. So these are uh, high wave numbers. The limit would be about 4,000 wave numbers or so. And then uh, on the other side, the limit would be in a few hundred wave numbers, say uh, 200 or so. Uh, there's two regions. The one uh, from about 1,500 wave numbers and above, okay, which is what, where we, uh, what we use to identify functional groups in a molecule. And this region, which we call the fingerprint region, which is specific to a molecule fingerprint. Okay. So, for example, within this molecule, what we actually know is that the CH stretches, these ones will appear at frequencies of about 3,000 wave numbers, more or less. Okay, the carbonyl, this one, will appear at frequencies of about oh, 1,700 wave numbers or so, with a variation of plus minus 50 or so. This NH uh, might appear at, uh, you know, wave, uh, wave numbers of about 3,200 or so, and this OH will appear at uh, a little higher frequencies, maybe uh, 35, 3700 uh, wave numbers or so. You don't need to know these numbers. I'm just um, uh, letting you know so that uh, you can learn how to uh, use infrared spectroscopy to identify. So the key here is that if we see a band in our spectrum of this molecule at 1700 wave numbers, there is going to be a very good indication that this molecule has a carbonyl group and that is going to be quite useful. If we see a peak at about 3,500 wave numbers, then we, will con we can conclude that that molecule is likely going to have an alcohol group, and so forth, you can actually continue and, and again, identify functional groups. Uh, now, this, this technique is not going to be very useful in telling you the specific connectivity of the atoms. That is that you actually have CH2s uh, here, CH2s here. It's going to be impossible with infrared spectroscopy to tell exactly that you have two CH stretches, two CH2, uh, groups between a carbonyl and an and NH, another two between the NH and the OH. All of these groups will, will appear kind of at the same frequency and it will be very difficult for you to tell exactly how many of them you have and what is the connectivity. NMR which be, will be a much better technique at actually uh, you know, making up the structure of the molecule, how those atoms are really connected. But infrared is very uh, uh, easy to use. And again, you can learn a lot of information like, well, what type of groups you have. So, so again, we can conclude that we will have a carbonyl, an amine, and an OH, and then CH stretches uh, with a lot of confidence without doing you know, very, very complicated measurements. So that's pretty useful. Now, uh, in the lower frequency region, it turns out that you will get vibrations that involve the entire molecule, right? So they might be useful uh, to tell you exactly what molecule you have, but this is not used as much as the identification of functional groups which happens above 1500 wave numbers or so. Okay, so that is uh, kind of the main application for infrared spectroscopy. Uh, we'll talk more about that uh, in class, uh, uh, but for now I think this is all that I wanted to tell you about infrared. Uh, one uh, topic that I also want to discuss in this video is Raman spectroscopy. 
and how is uh, dif how it is different and similar and similar to infrared spectroscopy. All right, so what we've actually learned from now about infrared spectroscopy is that you're going to have your vibrational levels for a molecule for normal nodes, and this will be V0, V1, V2, and so forth. And what we normally do is we have the molecule in the ground vibrational state according to the Maxwell uh, distribution of energy law, and then according to the selection rules in the harmonic approximation model, you can excite the vibration from V0 to V1. Okay, so that's your regular infrared spectroscopy. Now in Raman, what happens is that uh, you measure scattered photons, not uh, absorbed or transited photons. Okay, so you radiate the, uh, the sample with photons and you see the ones that are scattered uh, with an energy a little bit above or a little bit before the incident one. So the idea here is that uh, you're also promoting vibrational transitions, but you're not doing directly, you're not placing the system directly from V0 to V1. Instead, in Raman spectroscopy, what happens is that uh, you shine a photon of much higher energy, this will be in the visible ultraviolet, and it goes to an intermediate state, which in some cases is an electronic state of the molecule, uh, and that's what we call resonance Raman, spectro resonance Raman spectroscopy. And then the molecule uh, comes back emitting a photon, and in this case notice that, well, the initial energy of the photon that you have uh, shown in the molecule is a little bit different from the final photon that you actually have, right? You have lost a little bit of energy, uh, but notice that the initial and the final step you have is V0 and V1, much as in direct infrared spectroscopy. Okay, so in this case, that you lose a little bit of energy, this is what is called Stokes uh, radiation, and it's uh, a kind of useful language. This is what how Raman spectroscopy works. Raman spectroscopy um, is a good technique because it gives you a lot of sensitivity, uh, even though it's not as used as infrared spectroscopy. Now, uh, the uh, selection rules are uh, very different from what happens in uh, infrared spectroscopy. You can actually uh, access V2, V3, and so forth. Uh, uh, there's no, no, no the restriction that you actually have under the harmonic oscillator model. And the other thing that can happen is that if you, if you initially come vibrationally excited, okay, so you can actually uh, do this, okay, so your initial state in the, uh, is in V1, and then you might actually, uh, when you hop back, uh, come back to the ground state, right? So that will be HV double prime. We want to notice that in this case, you actually have earned some energy in this process. That is what we call anti-Stokes radiation. Now, uh, we can try to determine uh, normal node infra uh, Raman activity uh, much as we did for polyatomic molecules, right? So we examine a molecule and see how many uh, different modes it has to vibrate and then we uh, envision the vibrations in our head and we can determine whether they change the dipole moment or not. And uh, that tells, about, about, tells us about uh, infrared activity. Well, something similar could be done for Raman, but instead of uh, uh, Raman, uh, infrared spe Raman spectroscopy being sensitive to the change in the dipole moment during the vibration, it's actually uh, sensitive to the polarizability, which is something that we have studied. And it turns out that uh, understanding how the polarizability of a molecule changes while it's vibrating is much harder to do, is less intuitive than seeing how the dipole moment changes. But uh, uh, there's a way that we can still learn a little bit about what uh, uh, vibrations will be Raman active uh, by if the molecule has something that we call a center of inversion. Okay, so a center of inversion in a molecule is uh, something that again is going to be helpful in determining Raman activity. Think about this molecule where these excess can be anything. This can be CO2 if you want to, or, or uh, any other atom. Uh, what you do to determine if the molecule has a center of inversion is just uh, uh, look at where the geometric center of the molecule or the center of mass is, which in this case will be right here. And then what you do is you look at every single atom, pass it through the center, and see if there's an identical atom to the other side of the center, right? So we take this atom and then connect it through the center, and then we project that to the other side uh, and then find whether there's a, uh, an atom that is exactly the same, right? So this molecule, like CO2, does have a center of inversion, okay? This molecule will have a center of inversion. What about water, right? Uh, water is like this, all right? So the, the center of the molecule is going to be uh, uh, somewhere around there, right? So the idea is that you're going to connect every single atom with the center and see uh, if on the other side, Okay, when you project it uh, to the other side, you find exactly the same atom. Clearly, in this case, in water, you don't have a hydrogen atom right at the other side of the center of inversion, so this molecule does not have a center of inversion. Okay, let's uh, do a couple more examples here um, to figure this out. 
Uh, this is benzene. Okay? Uh, we have a carbon atom in each one of these uh, vertices here of the molecule, and then you have eight atoms uh, right here. All right, so let's try to determine if this molecule has a center of inversion. Uh, uh, the center of the molecule is right there, and again, what we'll have to do is just uh, uh, connect every single atom to the center of inversion, then project to the other side and see if we have the same atom. So let's take this carbon atom right here, we connect it through the center of the molecule, look at the other side, and we actually find exactly the same carbon on the other side. So this carbon uh, is inverted through the center, and you can see that this carbon will also be inverted, that carbon as well, and all of the hydrogens will be inverted uh, uh, through the center, which means that this molecule does have a center of inversion. Okay. Now, if we change this to, say, fluorine, okay, what will happen is that, well, this carbon uh, uh, can be inverted through the center, that carbon, all of the hydrogens, but when you look at uh, when you look at fluorine, right, uh, you connect it through the center, then look at the, at the other side, and you don't have the same atom. Instead, you have a hydrogen atom. So in this molecule here, you do not have a center of inversion. But if we were to replace this by a fluorine atom, then in this case, you do have a center of inversion. All right, so why is the center of inversion business so important? Uh, uh, the center of inversion informs something that we call the exclusion rule. And this helps us determine whether uh, a node might be Raman active. The exclusion rule says that for molecules that have a center of inversion, no vibrational node can be both infrared, infrared active and Raman active. Okay, so for a molecule like this, if we actually find a normal node, uh, which we can determine that is infrared active, then we can conclude right away that that mode will not be Raman active. Okay, so let's go back to CO2. Uh, because that's a molecule whose vibrations we already examined. All right, so think about CO2, and let's look at the anti-symmetric stretch or asymmetric stretch. So that, that is the one in which the uh, stretches are asynchronous, okay? So that in that mode, we actually saw that uh, that changes the dipole moment during the vibration, and that mode will be infrared active. Because this molecule has a center of inversion, then we can conclude right away uh, that that same mode, the asymmetric stretch, will not be Raman active. Okay? Now, there was another mode in this molecule which was the symmetric stretch, in which the CO's uh, stretch and compress at the same time uh, in, in, in a synchronous manner. Right? What we determined then is that, well, the dipole moment in that vibration is actually not changing, so then uh, that node will not be infrared active. Now, uh, we don't actually know if the molecule will be Raman active, uh, because it's possible that a, that a mode is not active either in infrared or Raman. But what we can say is that the mode might be Raman active. Okay? So again, if the, mode, if, if the mode is infrared active, then you know that you, for sure it won't be Raman active because the exclusion rule tells you that you can have both activity in the infrared and Raman spectrum. Okay? If the mode is not infrared active, it's possible that it might not be Raman active either, but it might be Raman active. Okay, we just don't know. Right, so that's, that's kind of the exclusion rule. And again, uh, in the book you will find applications for Raman spectroscopy. This is something that uh, uh, you'll have to read on your own. Uh, but in, in essence, this is all that I wanted to tell you about vibrational spectroscopy. How do you use photons to promote transitions between vibrational levels, right? So in infrared spectroscopy, you do it directly, go from V0 to V1 regularly using a low energy infrared photon in Raman you can still use uh, or, or promote those transitions, but you do that indirectly, okay, by shining a photon that is of much higher energy, and then a photon is scattered uh, that uh, uh, places you in, in, in a vibrational level different from the one uh, that you departed from.